Hi, this is Justin from Sonic Scoop, coming at you from Joel Lambert Mastering. Today's quick tip, sometimes the worst place to start a mix is at the beginning. What does that mean? Stay tuned and find out. If you're anything like me, you've started a mix from the beginning at a sparse intro at some point in your life where you've had maybe just an acoustic guitar and a vocal in the beginning. Or maybe it's bass, drums, and keys before all the other instruments come in. Or maybe it's something atmospheric and you create some really big, beautiful, luxurious sounds for this intro. Well, by the time your first verse comes along, you've already eaten up a lot of space and now you're putting things on top of these kind of luxurious intro sounds that you've established. And then by the time your chorus comes along, my goodness, you're really running out of space. Now what do you do? Do you start carving things out, maybe kind of trying to use an EQ to create space where there's no space? And then by the time you get to your last chorus, my goodness, if you had any space left at all to shoehorn one more instrument into, you'd be just static, but it's just not there. If this has ever happened to you, you're not alone. There's actually a lot of really great mixers that I know who often routinely dive in to the most dense section of their songs first, specifically because of this. Thankfully, there's no rule that says you have to start your mix at the beginning. And diving into your densest section first can be a really big boon to your mixes. So in the next mix that you do, I'm going to recommend that you don't just start at the beginning. Try first diving into the most dense section of your song and start working there. If you saw our quick mixing tips from last week, you know that I'm kind of an advocate for starting by bringing up your most essential instruments first. This might be a vocal, it might be the drum kit, and then bringing in your kind of next most important instruments. You should always have an idea in mind of what the focal point of any section is, and you should try to bring in sounds in that order. One of the other things you'll start to discover, the better and better you get at mixing, is that it's not really about finding one fader position that works for the entire song. It's okay not to just start at your most dense section, but also to have slightly different mixes for each section. And this can be in fader settings. You can do fader rides, fader automation from section to section. But you might also even have different EQs on different instruments section by section. Now, this kind of approach isn't necessary for every single mix, but for really dense arrangements and for really ambitious productions, it may be well within reason to have kind of one EQ setting for your kick in the chorus and a different EQ setting for your kick in the verse. And that's okay. Maybe in the intro, there's a lot of space for a big, luxurious keyboard sound. But by the time you get to your last chorus, that keyboard sound has to be kind of a skeleton of itself to leave room for all of the other elements that have been introduced. A great mix is really like a living, breathing organism. And a really great mix can kind of unfold like a story unfolds. You're not necessarily doing your best work if you're just trying to find one static setting to keep everything at through the duration of the entire mix. Rather, it can be very, very wise to not start at the beginning and to instead work in sections from your most dense kind of outward. And this can allow you to have a mix that continuously ramps up and ramps up and ramps up in intensity as it goes along and maybe has little dips and little peaks. And it's a bit hard to do that by starting at the beginning and just working all the way through. But if you start at one of the most dense and majestic sections in your mix, make that really huge and then kind of work backwards from there. Often that's the way where you can kind of see deeper into the story and help it unfold. Once you know where it should go, it's much easier to get there. There's a novelist I really like named John Irving, and he says every time he writes a novel, he always has his last sentence in mind before he even begins. He says that once you know how a story ends, it's just a matter of getting there. And the same thing can be true for your mixes. Once you know where the kind of big payoff is, your kind of big climax is in a mix, and every mix should have some kind of climax. Once you know where that is and how intense it's going to be and what the payoff is going to feel like, then it's just a matter of making the entire mix and the entire song feed into that section. 
Now, don't take this too far. Of course, I'm not saying you should only have one interesting section, and that's the focal point of the entire song, and everything else doesn't matter. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. But you should be conscious of the idea of there being kind of ebbs and flows in a mix, and there being distinctly different sections. And sometimes, you can accent that by having slightly different fader positions, slightly different kind of EQ and effect settings for each section. That's okay. And you don't have to go crazy with this necessarily to start. If you haven't tried this mixing in sections approach yet, you can start in a fairly minimal way. Just start mixing your chorus, and then go back to the intro and see how things are and adjust from there. But as you get more and more advanced, you might start getting an urge to think of each section of a song as a different piece in the puzzle of this song. Your settings don't have to be wildly different from section to section. But if they are different, that's okay. You're probably doing something right. You can record automation if you have some kind of console or control surface with uh, moving faders, but you can also do this just mousing around in your DAW. And it's okay to loop a section, kind of go in, maybe in Pro Tools, take your trim tool, and try different level settings for each section. Don't be afraid to turn on automation in your plugin. You can add a treble boost or a low end cut to one instrument in a dent section and take that away in a more sparse section where that instrument can kind of be fuller bodied. Now this quick tip is just one element in a larger strategy for getting great mixes. And if you want to blow through your mixing plateaus and really get to the next level, what you need to develop is a strategy of your own. This is one of the reasons I'm excited to announce a course we have planned for next month called Mixing Breakthroughs. And it's all about developing a strategy that's going to take you from being an okay mixer who kind of knows how this stuff works to a really great mixer. This is a course with over two and a half hours of training. The strategies that you want to have in place to be able to mix really well, really fast with a minimum of fatigue, as well as the little fun tricks and tactics that go into that larger strategy uh, that can kind of be little eureka moments of, I never really knew what I was doing with reverb before until now, and I get it. Or, I never really knew what I was doing with a compressor or with parallel compression before until now, and I get it. So if you've been mixing for a little while, and you feel like you've kind of plateaued in your skills. You've learned the basics, you know your way around a compressor, you know your way around an aux send, uh, and you just want to figure out how do the real pros do it? How do they do it so quickly, so efficiently, and so well? Well, me and the other folks from Sonic Scoop are happy to help you out with that. Since 2009, we've been interviewing producers and engineers, great ones, big ones, Grammy winners, some of your favorites, about their craft, their process, their approach. I personally have hosted moderated panels for the AES convention, my Platinum Engineers panels, where we bring together a slew of some of my favorite producers and engineers and talk about their approach to mixing. Personally, I'm also a total nerd for this stuff myself. I read countless books about mixing. Probably any book you've ever heard about mixing, I've read. But more importantly than that, I've done it for a long time too. I've spent the last 15 years making a living doing audio. This is not to say I'm the greatest, I'm not. But I listen, I pay attention, and I've learned a lot by really opening my ears and asking people who are better than me about their strategies. What goes into a great mix? And there's as many different ways to mix as there are mixing engineers, but there are some common touchstones that I run into again and again. Some threads that seem to run through the approach of most great mixers. As always, we'll reveal a ton of these kind of hidden industry secrets for free on sonicscoop.com. And I recommend you go to sonicscoop.com right now, <laughs> subscribe to the mailing list if you haven't already, subscribe here on YouTube for all the great free stuff that we put out. But if you want the best of the best, consolidated in a kind of easy to swallow, course-based format, where we trim away all the fat and share time-tested, platinum record-making strategies with you, in a way that'll take your mixing skills from where you are now to where you want them to be, 
Well, I encourage you to check out our upcoming course on mixing breakthroughs. At the premium levels of this course, you can even get personalized mix critiques, mix coaching. So I encourage you, follow the link at the end of this video, find out more. In the meantime, this has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop at Joel Lambert Mastering. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.